So, you broke your toe today, did you? I think so. I've broken three times before, and I think I've done it again. It's really sore. Dog training, or? No, no, I just tripped up. (laughs) All right, okay, nothing that exciting then. No, no, not at all. So, you've been doing some... You you did a workshop last time I spoke to you, didn't you? Yes. Uh, Tell me about that. What what was that uh, that on again? That was on multiple dogs, wasn't it? Just trying to remember off the top of my head. Which one? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was when I was going up to Aberdeen. Yeah, it was um, multiple dogs, the good, the bad, and the sensible. Yeah, how did that go? Really good, yeah, really good. Really well received. Um, lots and lots of dog walkers came along to that, so that that's a positive thing for them to be reaching out and trying to learn. Um, yeah, it went really, really well. Can't complain. So when you say multiple dogs... What do you mean? Because last time we had a bit of a... Because I thought you meant training multiple dogs at one po- at one time. No, <laughs> no. Well, which would have been really impressive. Well, well, I've got three <laughs> dogs that I train at one time, so there we go. Um, no, multiple dogs. We covered basically from introducing a puppy into a home with existing dogs right through to introducing a rescue dog or a second dog that's older into a household with existing dog or dogs. And then we branched right out onto training classes, what I consider to be a good prototype for a training class because that's a multiple dog situation, Uh, down in the dog park or in the local park because we don't have dog parks in this country, we just have countryside, Um, uh, you know, when is it sensible to be allowing your dog to interact with other dogs and when should you intervene? Those sort of things. And then we covered the professional dog walkers aspect at the, again, how I believe that dog walking should best be run. I'm not trying to be the, the law here, but it's just how I think it should be run. So we covered quite a lot. Um, it was like a, a three hour talk. So covered a lot of stuff. Sure. Um, when you talk about multiple dog households, I know a lot of people, especially dog owners, people that aren't trainers, the first thing that's going to come to their mind is pack fear, isn't it? Yeah. And, and do you have to keep your older dog dominant or anything like that? Um, yeah, that, uh, that question was posed to me, but I, I'm a great believer in if you're dealing with a multiple anything, multiple children, multiple people, multiple dogs that you have to treat each and and each and every single one as an individual. And that individual's needs have to be catered to. So when you're dealing with multiple dogs, for example, you're not dealing with a group of dogs. You're dealing with a set of individuals. I can only go by, I have three dogs. Whether there's dominance or not, who knows? Because it's, it's such such a huge subject and we don't know enough about it that I just cater to each and every single one of the dog's individual needs and they are all very individual. If I treated them all the same, then I have no doubt in my mind that there would be some sort of conflict because each individual's needs were not being catered for. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, So I think when you're dealing with a group of dogs, the mindset that you need to get out of is that you're, you know, you're dealing with a pack. You're dealing with, say, two, three, four, five individuals. And that's why people should really think long and hard before they have a multiple dog situation, that do they have the time to dedicate and it's not, it's not bags of time. It is at first when you first introduce a dog into the household because they've got to get to know you. You've got to get to know them. And if you've got other dogs, you're also having to care for their needs too. So you should really think long and hard that do you have the time to apply to all of that. I still walk my dogs individually sometimes. We still do some things one-to-one. It's not all about them always hanging out together they are very much treated as individuals. That's Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, do you have some examples of, of ways that you treat each one different, or do you treat them as individuals? Uh, well, yeah, because I know them as their, their doggy parent, what their likes and dislikes are. I mean, I have one that is completely bomb-proof, um, as in you can introduce her to anything or anyone, 
but she has a bit of a hunting streak in her and we've trained her exactly the same way as we have the other two but she really has a massive chase drive so we've got to ensure that when we have her out that although there's areas where the boys can be off lead and you can take your foot off the gas with them in certain areas for her you very much need to switch on you know, I've got my oldest boy now, who I'm sure you've seen a lot of on Facebook, is having his little health issues. Um, so now we're having to adjust to his needs and doing some extra additional training to prepare him for the medical care that he's going to require. Then my youngest one, who is, it's just been, he's the spookiest dog you've ever met. He's the friendliest dog. He's like a chocolate Labrador trapped inside the Rhodesian Ridgeback's body. But he has a lot of um, fear-based behaviours, not so much now because he lives with a dog trainer and we've worked through them. But there are still situations where he can spook. Now, if I treated them all the same, then I wouldn't be able to adjust how I'm treating them all the time to suiting them. Um, Mines are pretty good because they are very laid back. They're used to my lifestyle and stuff, so they have fit in. But when we first introduced them all together as puppies, they've all, I've, all, I've had all my dogs as puppies, apart from previous dogs that I've had, but the current ones I have just now. When we've introduced them, it's very much been about pandering to each and individual's needs. So there's no need for conflict because I'm sure you know, Nick, Conflict only ever happens in dogs when they perceive resources or people or what they want to be limited. So it's about making sure that, you know, when a mad puppy comes along that your older dogs, their nose isn't too far out of joint. They are, their life isn't changing too much, but they still also have to accept that they've got a new brother or sister and they have to be a bit more patient. So... It's, it's a very complex. You could talk about it all day. It's such a yeah. Well, we've got we've got some time. So <laughs> it's interesting yeah. talking to, uh, listening to if you I'm, talk. Actually. If I'm rabbiting on, just say. Um, but it just, you know, there's just so many things now. You know, for example, oh, the best way I can put it is right. Like, I just gave all three dogs, all three of my dogs, a carrot. Now, when I give them a carrot, I have to give Flea his carrot first, not because he's dominant. But because if he waits those extra four seconds while I give Floyd and Tiger their carrot, he's jumping up and down like a maniac and he gets really excited. He loves carrots. It's not a problem. So we just adjust and just say, well, if we give you yours first, then you're not pestering everyone. You're not getting yourself over aroused or overstimulated. And then you can go. The other two are quite happy to wait. So it's just little things like that. It takes an owner in my opinion, just to observe and try and manage their lives a bit better to avoid any form of conflict. And I have never had any form of conflict between my three dogs ever. So I think that's testament. I've got an entire male, <laughs> I've got an older male, and I've got a very bossy female. So to have that and not have any form of conflict at all, I think it's a pretty good track record. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything you're saying definitely resonates with me. I've got two dogs and I can, I mean, similar things to what you're saying. Um, one of my little dog is an uh, absolute mad squirrel chaser. Um, so like you said, I have to be very careful about where I walk him. Um, or if I am walking him somewhere where there's going to be squirrels, I'm, I've got him on a long line or a lead or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's definitely considerations like that you've got to, you've got to think about when you've got multiple dogs, isn't it? Absolutely, and I think if you start going down, the, again, my opinion, <laughs> I like to say that just because I know that you know opinions just they, they vary, and I'm not saying that one person's wrong and one person's right, but in my opinion, if we're dealing with them like they are a pack of animal, then we're going to be treating them all the same, or we're going to be giving someone a higher status, for example, that maybe that's putting pressure on that one individual dog and we shouldn't do it. They should be treated as equals, but they should also have their individual needs catered for. I hear even positive trainers use the word pack. Do you feel like that word should be abolished or shouldn't <laughs> be used when it comes to dogs then? Oh, you know, I've, I've went through this whole 
debate argument so many times that I'm actually, if you had asked me 18 months ago, I would have said, you know, it's, it's just nonsense. But I think it depends on what you mean when you say it. I don't think there should be a big short, sharp intake of breath. It is just a word. And it's a word that we have heard since we have been children. You know, it's mm-hmm. always been referred to as a pack of dogs. It depends what you mean when you say it. I don't use the word, just quite simply, because I think we do need to to have a shift in how people see things. And as someone who educates dog training with my clients, I think it's really important to lead by example. But I still don't think that people should shy away from it. It is just a word. It depends how you're using the word. That's that's what interests me more than the word itself. But I, I, I know tons of dog walkers because I own a, a dog walking company and they very often refer to them as the pack. But they don't behave like pack leaders. So it's not yeah, really exactly. an issue. It's then just a way to describe the group of dogs that they have out at the time. So I think it's, I think it's important that positive trainers don't try and take too much that is... I use the word traditional away because then we do distance ourselves from primarily who it is we're trying to help, which is the dog on in public. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I've thought a lot about which words you should use. Um, for example, with my company, I call it bark play teach instead of bark play train, just because I feel like teach is probably a more yeah. real word. But I've heard other people, I think it's Zach George on YouTube hates to use the word dog owner and I think he suggests dog guardian or something like that as, a, as an alternative but it's like how far down that road do you travel but that's that's Zach George's opinion and for me everyone's allowed an opinion and they're allowed to have a preference at what they use as reference there shouldn't be you know a rule that says you can't say dog owner or you know dog mum or dog dad we know what they're not we're not their parents, but or dog guardian, if you like. It's totally up to you. What I just think that there's just too many constraints going on about what people feel like they can and can't say. And that's what causes a whole lot of arguments, especially between positive dog trainers. That, you know, I think that a lot of people believe that what they're saying is, is a good blueprint to follow and ideally it probably is but as soon as you start telling other people I don't like when you use that word you're immediately distancing them from you so how are you ever meant to get any further forward if you're just continuously covering ground that's that's meaningless it's worthless it's I mean it's 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 quite pedantic um but like you said it's it's people's own choice what word to use and it's their own choice on how they treat their dog as well and how they train their dog. I think what what we need to really punch through is that we're there to help, not to not to criticise or make life worse for them or make them feel like they're being judged. We've got to show by example what we do. We've got to sell our product and we're not going to sell it by being preachy. Yeah. <clears throat> That's just the way I view it. Yeah, no, I, no, don't feel uh, embarrassed or shy to show your opinions on this because this is this is the whole point yeah. of this. No, um, I mean, I, I think everyone should be allowed an opinion. I had an interesting conversation a few weeks ago, actually on my Facebook page with somebody who is a trainer who I don't know, but does appear to be a fantastic trainer, you know, just by the way he speaks, the way he presents himself. Um, he lives over the other side of the pond, so there would be no way that I could say whether he was good, bad, and different, and I don't like using that anyway. But he admitted to me, well, didn't admit, he was very forthcoming in giving information, that he will use a shock collar on a dog, and he gave examples of when he used it and how he used it, and it transpired that he's only used it twice in the last five years, and I think it turned out to be less than 1% of the dogs that he's trained Uh but when you can actually open a conversation like that where neither people are judging one another and they're listening I think that's the way that we need to really move forward the guy knew what he was talking about you know there was no two ways about it 
Oh, definitely. I think there's definitely um, pe- people... I, I was going to use the term force-free, but I guess it depends kind of where you draw that line. There's people that are, that are really into training, that know what they're talking about, that do use shot collars, spray collars, etc. very rarely. And they're certainly not you know, people that are disconnected, they know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen DVDs by people that use sh- shot collars that are incredible dog trainers otherwise, um, or they're still incredible with a shot collar, but it's just something that we don't agree with ethically. Exactly. But, exactly. Um, but uh, I mean, we're kind of going into shot collars now. <laughs> Sorry. You, but, well, no, it's fine, because I wanted to get around to it eventually anyway, because <laughs> you're you're kind of quite vocal about supporting the ban of shot collars. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So even though there are people out there that are knowledgeable, etc., you still think in 100% of cases we shouldn't be using shot collars? Or, well, shot collars. Yeah. Uh, it goes against, for me, it goes against all my ethics. Um, I've yet to be presented with a dog that, I felt there was a need for. So, you know, there could be a part of ignorance on my part. But I still, it just goes against every fibre of my being. I always think there's an alternative. And even in the cases where this this gent was explaining to me what he used them, even though I wasn't going to argue with him, because that's, you know, it's not for me to call, I still felt like, from what he was saying, in my opinion, there was an alternative. Um, you know, it was a case of this, It was a, I think it was a Nordic breed, and it just wouldn't stop chasing. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why not just keep it on leash? Because that is an alternative. Absolutely. And we can go down the whole road of, well, leads are aversive and this, that, and the next thing, but we're just, head- not as well, we're just yeah. heading into silly territory then, you know. Like- not as an aversive as an electric shock to the neck. Exactly, like- exactly. exactly. Um, so do you feel the same way about spray collars and citronella collars and whatnot? Yes. Um, because They contain harmful products. Um, and we're still going down the line of stopping behaviours that could be dealt with otherwise. I, I strongly believe that a dog has a right to display natural behaviours. And some of those behaviours aren't acceptable in a human world, and I understand that. And I think the dog then has a right to an education at how to better behave in those situations, not to be punished for exhibiting natural behaviours. That's just where I come from, and it, whether that makes sense or not, it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> No, I completely agree with you. I'm I'm definitely for the ban of shot collars and spray collars. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't, you know, I would quite happily see prong collars banned as well. And and choke chains yeah. are just ridiculous. Um, but you know, I understand, like you, I I know there's people out there and knowledgeable people as well that do do use them in a small minority of cases. But then at the same time, there's other people that entirely rely on them Norman not really in this country so much but but over in America certainly um there's quite a few in this country as well that's where I find the biggest problem Nick to be perfectly honest with you I have an issue with the use of shock period but seeing the this is why I got involved in the ban the shock campaign I was invited to help out with it and I did think long and hard about it first even though I am vocal about it I thought do I really want to go down this road but it, I'm seeing an increase of people who are setting up as dog trainers and they should be looking to seek for education to look for the less aversive way and arm themselves up with the education that you and I have done but they're just relying solely on punishment. It's just wave after wave of jerks, kicks, pokes, shocks. It's it's that for me is when it starts to just become abusive, and that's why I decided that I would put my name to the ban the shock, and I would absorb myself in it completely, because this is a growing trend and it needs to stop. It certainly needs to stop, and I think, I mean, it's uh, the use of punishment as a dog trainer specifically is either 
normally a result of a lack of knowledge or just a lack of willpower. I mean, I think as, as people that have made a commitment to force free training, everyone, and then no one talks about this, but everyone has an urge to use punishment sometimes when a dog is being particularly annoying, but you just have to fight that urge a little bit. I mean, just this morning I was doing a session with a Doberman that kept mouthing my arm, kept mouthing my arm, kept mouthing my arm. Of course, as a human being, that is very frustrating. But at the same time, we've made a commitment to, to doing things force-free, and there's no way that I would use punishment to, to resolve that situation. I think it, actually, there's another interesting subject, is the use of punishment. You know, even as force-free trainers, we use punishment whether we like it or not. It's how you define punishment. That's, again, the important part. I mean, if a dog is consistently jumping up on a child coming into the household, then I'm going to put the dog on a lead and prevent it from doing that, which by definition is a punishment. You know... <laughs> Yeah, I, I used the wrong term. Yeah, there, no, no, I, and I, I wasn't picking up on you there. I was just thinking it's a very interesting thing that especially trainers that use, that rely on aversives, and I see this quite a lot on, like, say, their Facebook pages and stuff like that. They've got stupid pictures of, like, a Rottweiler hanging off a person's arm, you know, like it's a cartoon, and it's got, uh, I'm a force free trainer, so I won't stop this. I mean, it's just ridiculous that they seem to think that we are just living like Doris Day all the time. I mean... I'm a force free trainer, so I went... Oh, I, I see what you're saying. It? Yeah. Have you not seen it? No, I haven't it's, seen it. It's like a cartoon, and it's I think it's a Rottweiler. It's a black and tan big dog. And it's like got a person's arm in its mouth, and there's blood and everything everywhere, and it's got... like I'm, I think it's I'm a positive trainer, so I'm just going to stand here. I'm not going to do anything about it. It's really unbelievably so silly. wrong <laughs> well it's silly and it's just trying to evoke a reaction isn't it well that's it but i think you know when you look at, at at these sort of graphics that go out then what we need to remember is even although we know it's silly if that person has like seven thousand people on their facebook page chances are more than half of them are dog owners and they're absorbing all that information so, yeah. you know, there'll be some of them actually believe that, and they do. It's the same with the old purely positive chestnut. It's like, no one's purely positive. I consider yeah. myself to be a very good positive trainer, but I make mistakes. But in the same vein, I can't be purely positive. It's impossible. I'd like to be. <laughs> I was just about to say, what I think, um, I think the thing is, no one's well, no one that I've ever met is purely positive, purely because the amount of skill required to be purely positive, and when we say positive, we don't mean force-free, we're just talking about positive reinforcement. Exactly. Rewards and whatnot. It would take a ridiculous amount of skill to be able to, to be at that level, but we all strive towards it. Oh, absolutely. Think... There's nothing wrong with aiming for the, 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 you know, the most positive reinforced-based training program possible which is that exactly where I aim for but at some point coming down the line you do have to oh, I better pick my words wisely here or there'll be arrows coming you do have to disagree with the dog and say sorry buddy you cannot do that yeah but it's how we set tell the dog sorry buddy you cannot do that I think what, what defines us ethically as trainers. Sure. Well, I, I've rem well, <laughs> you just reminded me of um, there was a transparency challenge, wasn't yeah. there? I think it was last year, um, talking about that and how you punish a dog without being aversive or how people go about it. So what kind of punishments do you use when you're talking about... I'm, I'm, using punishment well you know if like, let's say for example now i'm not using it as a training but you would definitely have to use it as management so let's say for example i'm called out to a client whose dog every time it gets a bone turns into satan now the first thing i'm going to say to them is until we work on this until we work through this if we're not training the dog can't have a bone 
That's a punishment. Yeah. If a dog is going to continue to jump up on me, you know, I had a little golden retriever at puppy class last night, and we were doing quite a tricky exercise. So you have to borrow someone's dog. <laughs> Sure. Um, you know, because you always explain it to the class, and then you know, if you see a few blank faces, you do always say, "Do you want me to show you?" Because I would prefer not to show them. I would prefer them to do it themselves. So I'd taken this little golden retriever, and oh my god, she's adorable, but she really likes to mob you. Like really, like you know, she's just a happy, jolly dog. She's jumping up on you. She's trying to get her nose in your bait bag. So immediately done a couple of exercises with her, seeing as she was getting heightened, and handed her back to her owner. Now, I'm punishing her because I'm not giving her my attention anymore. I didn't shout at her. I didn't lift my knee up. I didn't do anything. I didn't say anything. I just, you know, laughed it off. Right, she's had enough. Give you back to your owner. That's a punishment because that dog wanted to stay and mob me. She was having really good fun doing it. It... I think we've always got to be careful when we use the word punishment because everyone thinks that you're you're meaning that you're going to do something deep and evil. I mean, I'll punish my kids by not letting them play PlayStation. Sure. It's hardly going to hurt them. Um, but, you know, if, if they're not tidy in their rooms, then I have to communicate with them. I can't say every time you clean your room, I'll give you a tenner because they would then do their room every single day and I would be skint. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So at some point you do need to say, you know, well, you can't behave like that. And if you do that, then this has to be taken away. Classic example as well. If you're, I always say to people, when you take your dog somewhere new, know your environment. And it, if you pop the dog on a long line at first, of it, I, if it's got a history of not that good a recall, but it's okay. Pop them on a long lead. And if they don't engage with you, then pop them back on their short lead again. Because if they're not going to engage with you on, say, 15 foot, you've got absolutely no chance if they're free. So that's a punishment. But we don't have to be shouting at the dog or doing anything else because then it's like two crosses on your homework. We only need to give them one. They very quickly sure. get it. So, yeah. It's interesting that you, I mean, you brought up long lines there, and I'm changing the topic a little bit. But I've spoken to a few people recently that dog, had dogs with kind of mediocre recalls that didn't want to use the long lines because they felt it was they felt it was cruel to keep them confined. And I kind of had to explain to them that you know you have to sacrifice those few weeks or few months of recall training on a long line in order to have a dog that can just have the freedom of running around. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting you you bring that up. Even something because, um, uh, well, something that I certainly don't associate with with any kind of cruelness or anything can be a punishment. And the, as, like, like, look at it from the dog's perspective. Of course, it's a punishment. You know, if they've got the choice of freedom or a lead, what are they going to choose? They're going to choose sweet freedom every single time. Absolutely. And another thing, actually, you mentioned, sometimes we punish dogs and we don't even realise we're punishing them. I, I, when, when I teach classes, sometimes I'll see people... Are you still with us? Yeah, yeah. Oh, OK, sorry, I went a bit weird there. I'll see people doing the training, doing the training, and then a dog gets it right and they give them a treat and then pat them on the head. Yeah, and the dog and the hates dog's it. Like, <laughs> yeah, the dog hates it. Um, but they don't even realise it because they associate patting the dog on the head with a reward. But the dog, it doesn't. The dog finds it a punishment. I, I find a way around that, Nick. I actually say to them, I'm sure your dog absolutely loves you clapping them. But just now, they're so absorbed in their learning that they just want to carry on doing more. So can we just wait to the end for Pat? That seems yeah. to work. <laughs> that's that's the human half of dog training, that is. That's, uh, <laughs> that's human psychology. <laughs> and they all go, oh, right. I'm like, just look at your puppy. It's just It just wants to carry on. It's like, tell me more. Go with it. Yeah, Go with and we it. need, yeah, and we need to be really aware of what's a reward and what's a punishment for our individual dogs. I mean, we've come full circle, really, because we were talking in the beginning about individual dogs and and being aware of of their needs, and the same thing with their punishments and their rewards. Absolutely, I know dogs out there that you could probably you could shout at all day long, and it would mean nothing to them. It would mean nothing. They would just be like, "Here we go." Yeah. And they would do as they were told because, you know, it's the best way to keep the peace, but they wouldn't be affected by it. 
But then I know dogs out there that, you know, if you, if you stick the biscuit back in your pocket, it's as if their entire world has just shattered. So you do, you do have to be mindful of, you know, what one dog finds aversive or reinforcing is not necessarily what another dog's going to find aversive or reinforcing. Yeah, actually, I just had a thought about, um, I was watching a criticism of positive training, well, probably a couple of months ago now, and he was talking about how he tried to raise two dogs purely positively, and then um, at a further point, I think it was with lead walking training or something like that, when they were about a year and a half years old, and he had to... No, I think he said he told the dog off slightly, and it completely crumbled, and he was saying that if you don't have some kind of punishment as they're growing they just never acclimatize to it and then they just crumble at the slightest sight of you know punishment or... I think that really um uh, I think feel free to to rant but... <laughs> well, you know I do I do strongly believe that if our dogs are not exposed to any form of stress, then they're never going to learn to cope with stress. I think what we also need to remember is there cannot possibly be a stress-free life, apart from maybe my husband. Um, but there, you can't have a stress-free life. I mean, learning is stressful. I've got a ridgeback throwing a squeaky bone about. Sorry if you can hear that. That's all right. That's the nature that's, of the podcast, really. That's, isn't it? That's the, I'm that's, surprised we haven't had more, to be that's honest. That's the Labrador style one. He's like suddenly decided, let's just uh, pull out right. the squeakies. Um, we can't, you know, learning is stressful. When you bring a puppy into first puppy class, there's going to be an element of stress there. It's up to us to make that stress go away really quickly or make them feel better about it so that they actually learn to bounce back from those feelings a vet office must be so stressful you know i've seen where the thermometers go that can't be good and no matter how much training you do that still can't be good so there has to be an element and i think there is a bit of truth in that but i mean i don't know do you have kids no, I don't know. If you have a household full of children, your dog is not going to crumble at shouting because they are used to it from a very young age because kids shout. So that kind of prepares your dog for that, but without it being directed at them. So it should be okay for a bit of shouting to go on. Your dog shouldn't fall apart because of it, but you shouldn't necessarily be shouting at your dog. Again, sure. if that makes sense. It's, you know, it's, it's all down to early puppy exposure, if you can. I get that some people have got rescue dogs and, you know, they've missed out on that. It's when they're young, introducing them to, like, loud hoovers, loud music, you know, that sort of thing. So you think that what that guy was talking about was probably more to do with not setting that dog up with the ability to deal with stress as opposed to a put, uh, criticism of positive training absolutely i mean again this is why i keep saying we can strive to be purely positive but it's never going to be possible but what is not positive about having a noisy household you know there's nowhere that says if you're nice everything has to be quiet so i fail to see how loud noises or loud shouting or anything like that has anything to do with the the vessel of positive training it's ridiculous i went i went to an ian dunbar seminar a while ago <laughs> and he was talking about how the dishwasher <laughs> was it is it was it the dishwasher yes that's yeah. it the dishwasher yeah 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 but someone has to tell the story now because i think he's <laughs> he said that after he finishes a meal and they load up the dishwasher and he lights up his big fat cigar he used to shout at the top of his voice, Phoenix, you son of a bitch. Yeah. And then the dog would come running and get into the dishwasher. But that was a positively reinforced shouting and swearing at your dog. That's really clever. <laughs> yeah, so he'd cr- he, instead of um, the shouting being a punishment, the dog had learned that yeah. the shouting actually equals... Yeah. He's going to get to lick the dishes. It's, so it became a positive thing. Yeah, it's it's very, very clever. It's 
and you know that's what we need to kind of prepare our dogs for that if someone does shout at you, you you'll be cool with it because it's a predictor of good things that are about to happen uh, it's pushing it to the extreme but yeah it, i mean and another another instance of that kind of thing is the whole idea of early neurological stimulation where you you intentionally put puppies very young puppies under the degrees of stress so cold surfaces etc and then it gets them used to or they it creates adults that are better able to deal with stressors in their environment oh absolutely and if they're still with their mom and they're still with their litter mates you know if, if one of them's doing it monkey see monkey do one of my one of my chums is a is breeds Ridgebacks um, and she's a very occasional breeder and she doesn't breed for money or anything like that she simply breeds because I would say because she's good at it but she loves it and when uh-huh. you go up to her house when she's got a litter of puppies do you know what a pulley is? Uh, the breed? no 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 a pulley it's like Remember in the old days, you used to have a thing that came out of the sky in the kitchen that you would wheel down and you would hang your washing up on and then you would wheel it up. I don't know if it's just a Scottish thing. I don't know. I've never heard of right, it. Right, but it's a pulley. That's what it's called. And it's like, okay. a, it's like a wooden clothes horse, but it sits on the ceiling and you pull it up and down. She had okay. one of them right above the whelping box and she had pots and pans hanging from it. And, like, the family used to, like, drum it with wooden spoons and stuff. So it was, like, sure. clattering big noises. Our dogs are bomb-proof. I mean, when you get them as puppies, they're they're bomb-proof because they're just used to this. It's just all part of daily life. No, it's very smart. I mean, it's the whole idea as well of that, that app that became very popular, the Soundproof Puppy yeah. app. Um, getting you know you play them sounds you give them food etc so you're creating that positive association again the only criticism i'm going to make there nick and it's not about the the app the app is absolutely fantastic and it's something that i advise like right from puppy class and i still and i use it with older dogs as well that have maybe got issues towards noises i also use it for like conditioning a dog when it hears the doorbell to go to a mat rather than anything else um is that a lot of times owners are maybe getting puppies at eight, nine weeks old and the damage is already done because they haven't been exposed to this sort of stuff. So they are clawing their way back. I think a lot of people naively think because they're getting an eight week old puppy, they're getting a blank slate. It's far from it. Um, but that'll take us into a whole whole new territory. Um, Do you have to go? Or are you no, sleeping? no, I'm fine. I'm okay. fine. That would take us into a whole new territory. I think... Every a lot of the world just now has become anti breeder, but I think for me the key to saving dogs is there's not much we can do just now because it's almost like the floodgates have opened. We have to do something for the future. And I'm glad. Sorry, I've okay. cut you off. No, there. no. And I think the key to that actually lies with your good quality ethical breeders, and I think. You know, going back to praise what you like and ignore what you don't like. These people should be bigged up a little bit more than what they are. They're kind of categorised with, you know, the the money grabbing breeder or the backyard breeder or the puppy mills. Everything seems to be kind of clumped together rather than saying, you know, there's some fantastic ones out there and, you know, you want to get a puppy, here is where you need to go. No, I'm really glad that you brought that up, actually, because I, I share your view completely. Um, it's something that I'm quite passionate about. I haven't spoken about it very much. I'd really like to get um, some good readers, actually, to do the podcast. But um, definitely, it's so important that breeders do this kind of stuff, and it's just not happening anywhere near enough. And I'm really passionate as well about the crossbreeding projects that go on. Um, do, you, do you side then? You're not, you're not with me. Go on. You... No, I'm not talking about Labradoodles, Golden Doodles. Oh, all right, okay. I'm not talking about um, fashion or dogs that are bred for profit. I'm talking about crossbreeding projects where people are trying to breed healthy dogs, and we've there's there's people there's a movement out of there, quite a small movement of people that are just trying to breed dogs that are healthy with good temperaments, not dogs that particularly abide by some confirmation that the kennel club has put. put up. <laughs> um, 
I absolutely, and by the way, I sighed there. I'm not anti Labradoodle before I get a horse's yeah, head in my bed I'm or just... something like that. <laughs> that my problem with some of, with some of the cross breeding is that people are breeding them for profit and they aren't getting the, the health tests required, and no one's got any control over that, um, yeah. and that that's worrying. But the that's not. No, that's, that's not, not what you were meaning, and I'm bundle. totally with you. And going back to my chum, that is exactly what she does. I mean, she she loves her shows. There's no two ways about it. She loves going to shows and showing her dogs off. She doesn't care if she wins anything. She just likes the day out. Um, but she she's a great person that will say to you, you know, if I breed a litter of puppies, if there's no show dogs in it, I'm not that bothered. So long as they're healthy and they're happy and they go to good homes, that's the only criteria she is interested in. She said if they're all good looking, you know, so I don't know a bad looking dog. I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying that we do need to go back to, if you like, fit for purpose. And for me, fit for purpose should be fit, healthy, able to do what the breed was bred to do, but similarly not have the horrendous health problems that we have in some of the breeds that are, you know, out there. <laughs> yeah, I think the reason that the whole crossbreeding, the little crossbreeding movement that I've become aware of is so, um, just resonates with me so much is because we've gotten, it's very easy to become disillusioned with the system that is out there for pedigree dogs. Um, with the kind of, well, I, I mean, again, we could talk about so so much, but with the amount of, of bad breeding that goes on within pedigree dogs, as well as with puppy uh, puppy farms, and then, of course, you've got your back, backyard breeders as well. But it's, it's annoying because the kennel club and the whole system that surrounds pedigree dogs should be something that we see as prestigious, but it's just really, it's not, it's not that anymore. Uh, no, it's not, and I don't think it ever has been. And to be honest with you, I think the problem with the Kennel Club is it's actually blown up to be a bigger organisation than it actually is. It's almost like they are the power, they are the law regarding breeding, showing, training. And they are not that big an organisation. Sure. And I think that but again, should somebody need an organisation to be telling them what they need to do when a dog's health relies on it? I think, again, that goes back down to ethics. How someone can breed from a dog that they know is unhealthy is beyond me. Uh, there was a programme a while ago, and it was the, I think it was the boxer that stood out for me that had some serious kidney issues. I think it was, I think it was a kidney issue anyway. And he's got more than 800 offspring out there. I mean, that's not just a little. That's a lot. And that I think you shouldn't need somebody to tell you that's wrong. But obviously yes. people do. <laughs> so I'm not sure what the answer is, whether it's an, an organisation that oversees things or legislation. But what is abundantly clear is that we need to have people that are when people go out and buy a dog, they need to be far more aware than they are at the moment. Oh yeah. I mean, even among people I know, they if when they're after a dog, they they look for the one that's kind of within twenty miles of them. It's like when I get when I get my next puppy, I don't care if I have to go to Germany, Holland, wherever. I'll be looking for the most healthy dog, um, and the, the dog that fits my needs best. Absolutely. So we're going to end up with that dog for over ten years. Absolutely, it's. Uh... And it's you're doing the dog the justice. I think for me the answer to it, Nick, is we've got to make again the the dog owning public. We've got to empower them with as much education and information as possible, and that education and information has to be accessible for them. But unfortunately, people just hit their feet on a carpet and see a puppy in the melt, and that's it. And it's you know they see it as healthy because it's healthy right now. It sure. is, it's such a huge topic. It was actually it was discussed in the Scottish Parliament last week that um, the that the Kennel Club are are wanting to present a manifesto 
to the government, but the, the Scottish government actually responded that they were doing more than what the manifesto was presenting them with, um, already putting into play, looking at how they can stop this puppy trafficking, dog trafficking, bringing over puppies from Ireland, you know, backyard breeders, puppy mills, they're already looking to try and find solutions to all of this. But, you know, as they they said as well, and these are just politicians, that the problem is so big is where do you start? Yeah. Where do you start? Because, you know, one of the things that one of the the MSPs had said is what they ideally want to do is, is provide legislation and education for people from a dog before it's born up until the day it dies and that goes right through from how it's bred, where it's bred, how it's weaned, how it's trained, homes it goes to, health care, etc. But it's just, you know, where do you start? Yeah, I certainly don't think the answer, I mean, this. I just don't think that the answer is with the Kennel Club anymore. No, I, don't. I mean, we look at, there was a blog that I was reading just the other day. I, it's Jemima Harrison's blog from Pedigree Dogs Exposed. Mm-hmm. And she posted something that the Kennel Club had posted. Uh, it was a survey over multiple years. And it, you can just see the dog's lifespan going down and down and down and down until the present day. And it's like, oh, it's just insane. It's just, it makes you so mad. It does. Um, and really, ideally, dogs should be living longer now because our health care for dogs is far better. The diet for dogs is far better. Um, but that just doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, it's just it's, it's such a huge subject. It was refreshing to hear that the Scottish government were very much taken. They do appear to be very passionate about raising the standards that dogs are kept in, bred in, and trained in. They were quite vocal about that as well. So I think I think the future looks good, Nick. But it's the just now that's an issue. And I hope so. we have to carry so. on. And we have to be helping again, just helping the dog owning public at getting doing things a little bit better. Because they don't know, they're not doing it deliberately. Oh, I know. I've been there myself, and I think most of us have. Absolutely. Where you, you know, I I got my first puppy from just out of the papers, and I and I'm completely guilty of that. Um, but yeah, we need to get to a point where that isn't the commonplace. I know. And I think you're right about um, the future is bright. Certainly with training. I mean, training has gone so far, and it's going further and further. I mean, the awareness to husbandry and and the stress levels of the dog. I don't know if it's, I don't really know, to be honest with you, if it's just in my area, people are, I'm talking about trainers and behaviorists, are incredibly aware of it, or if this is a movement that's happening nationwide, it's very difficult to tell when you're in your own little bubble. But definitely, I mean, it's really coming on. With breeding, um, I'm not sure. I really hope so. And I think people like Jemima Harrison and the people that have those blogs and, and produce those documentaries revealing more and more of this problem are really doing great work. And I really hope that we just continue to go down that line. Was that the one that made the big blundering mistake saying that Rhodesian Ridgebacks have spina bifida? I don't know. It I was, know. it was. It was on the Pedigree Exposed programme. I think that was the, the part of it that they had to apologise for. Because um, the Ridge makes them as a spinal deformity. Whereas the Ridge and the Ridgebacks just cosmetic. It only goes as far as the hairline is got nothing to do with the spine i have no <laughs> idea but i i think i i've certainly a, think the majority of her work yeah, is very, uh, very i'm not criticizing what i was actually about to say is that that's a, a prime example of we can't always get it right someone's always going to know something better about a certain area and i think we all have to come together it was one thing that i took away when when we were all chatting networking after the parliament last week was that it's it's going to take the dog profession to start coming together rather than fragmenting any further than it already is because we're too busy arguing over should we call a dog a pack animal or not we need to come together and that goes from dog walkers, dog groomers, vets, vet technicians, dog trainers, dog behaviourists, the kennel club, 
you know, and all these various different organisations that we have, like, as you know, I'm with the Pet Professional Guild, I'm also an IMDT member. We need everybody to come together to move forward, because at the end of the day, it shouldn't be about an organisation or a person or someone who's really good on YouTube or anything like that. We're all collectively doing this together, whether we're vocal or not, for the good of dogs. And that's what we should all be focusing on. What a strong point to end it on. <laughs> <laughs> You've nailed that point, Home. Well, all right, brilliant. But that's great. That's just how I feel about it, Nick. And I think we've all got to remember is why did we become dog professionals? Why did I become a dog trainer? It wasn't to be a multimillionaire. You know, we have to pay our bills. That's inevitable. But why did I do it? Because I love dogs and I love people. And I love helping them with that connection. And we do have to bring everyone together. I think that's that's what's going to push us forward in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you. I really like that. Like, Brilliant. Sing it, sister. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right. Brilliant. Nice talking to you. Claire. Yeah, you too, Nick. And take care. And if you ever want to chat in the future, I'm more than happy to because I've really enjoyed that. Awesome. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> right. All right. Great. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Ta-da. Yeah. <laughs>